Welcome to the Wolf Den presented by Win Again Academy. I'm Matt Wolf, founder and CEO of Ticket Time Machine. Today we welcome Laura Skullman to the show. Welcome to the den. How are you? Hey, I love the hype music. That's got me ready to rock. That was fun. You're ready to go. I keep saying I got to change that. It's it's pretty good. It was from Canada. That was so good. I think we could do better. I feel amped up. But maybe not. I don't know. We'll have to play. We're going to play around with it a little bit whenever I have a, a minute to breathe. <clears throat> For those who don't know who you are, give us a, a quick intro and then we'll get to it. Um, well, my name is Laura Schoolman. I currently work with Blackstone Publishing. I'm the paid ads manager. Um, I got to know Matt through Weldon Williams and Lick. I was the, their director of marketing. Um, I've done some work with the Savannah Bananas and some restaurant marketing. So I've been all over the map and i'm excited to dive into some things seo and books and whatever we want to talk about yeah uh, uh first our thoughts go out to jim and his family at weldon uh, i passed uh this past week um a pioneer in the ticket uh printing industry which is where i uh got my start with eric kovitz and worldwide ticket craft who then got bought out by weldon but uh, a sad day for the ticket printing world and anyone who knew jim so we'll, we'll start out with that uh, marketing, it's such a vague term, isn't it? I mean, I when I was in college, I wanted to do marketing and promotions. And now you are you have to like expand, like, what does that mean? And there's so many different aspects of marketing and there's marketing and advertising and PR and communications. So a couple of things, what does marketing mean to you and how did you get into it? Um, so marketing to me, I believe is just, leading people into discussing a product service anything like that in the way that you want them to discuss it and in order to get that far you have to make them interested in bringing it up period so it's kind of disrupting and then also crafting the story that you want to tell um where it gets legs and continues on through word of mouth and you know sharing and viral sensations that type of thing and how um, did you get into marketing? Um, so I was actually at the University of Mizzou, Missouri. Um, I had a journalism scholarship and I was, um, you know, on the journalism track, but I sat in a marketing 3000 class um, and the professors started the class out with, there's like 3000 people in this lecture hall with a classic Budweiser commercial. And I guess I had never really thought about it before that that was actually a job, um, getting to be creative and sell people on things, products and stuff that you already love and enjoy, um, but also like bring humor into the mix and that type of thing. So um, that was really cool. And what's neat about that full circle is uh, Blackstone Publishing, we are launching a book soon called Family Reigns by Billy Bush. So it's about the um, Budweiser family dynasty, which is going to awesome. be so cool. That's awesome. Yeah, marketing, it, it's the story that you said is probably a common one. I, When I first saw the job for ticket printing, I'm like, this is a job? You just assume it was whatever, you know, and you learn about the behind the scenes things like how many people do you think uh, believe that Ticketmaster is a ticket company. They're not. They're a software company, right? And they're getting the tickets uh, back in the day and through Weldon. So it's like you just keep learning about how things happen that you have no idea. And there's so many of jobs like that and companies and products that you never heard of and people who are, you know, companies that are actually behind all of these products, whether it's the, the production of it or the marketing arm of it. And it's just interesting to to find out and learn about all of that. Yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, especially marketing, there's so many different like facets of it. Like I obviously don't make big Super Bowl commercials right now, but um, that would be awesome. I mean, all the SEO, there's, there's a lot of software that's needed. Um, there's a lot of different ways, you know, data analysts, um, if you're just into numbers and not really being creative, you could still be in the marketing field. There's just so many different avenues and it continues to change aggressively um, daily, weekly, monthly. So um, I would suggest anyone interested in the track to be aware of that. And you got to kind of like continue learning 
all throughout your career. It doesn't stop at college. I mean, it's a different world now than it was back then. But even still, you know, talking about a, something like Budweiser or Bush or Coke or Pepsi, these are all things that you really think sell themselves, but they spend a ridiculous amount of money on advertising and marketing. Even if you just talk about, you know, the Super Bowl and stuff like that. And what, why is that? Um, I mean, part of it is like the clout, I believe, but also just it, it engrades, it embeds these memories in our heads. I mean, Budweiser is a phenomenal example of disrupting um, the marketing game. Like they, they did things that no one had ever thought of in that time. Um, and, you know, it was a risk, but it really paid out for them. Um, you saw Pepsi follow suit with their, you know, Michael Jackson, Britney Spears commercials, that type of thing. Um, and they've always kind of like trailered Coke, I guess. But um, you you think about Pepsi and you you just always, you know, ev everyone our age and up remembers those commercials. Um, so the, the value there is really just insurmountable. Yeah, it's and it's interesting when I... You know, I like Coke. I'm a Coke guy, even though I don't really drink soda at all. But I think Coke is better than Pepsi. But a lot of that stuff is it's in either or you're a Coke venue or you're a Pepsi venue. So if you go somewhere, you're kind of going to drink almost whatever they have unless you decide to be like, I really don't like this. And that's, you know, beer is a little bit different, I guess. But some of this stuff is just what's what's available to you. So again, it's, it's, it's crazy to me how all the money they spent to do that, but obviously there are people smart enough to understand whatever money we're spending, we're expecting it to, to come back and it's being used. Uh, well, that's the, I guess the luxury of having such a big budget. You've worked with some companies that have a much smaller marketing budget. And so wh what do you, what are some of the things that you have to do or the mindset that you have to have? When you have a smaller budget and you can't afford to kind of just throw stuff at, at anything. I think the most valuable lesson I learned early on is just to experiment quickly, throw things out there and see what sticks. Um, when you have a smaller brand and a smaller budget, you don't really have to be so conservative and, you know, like, I guess, worried about your like image or anything like that. As long as you don't do anything like Balenciaga, um, you're going to be, you're going to be okay. Like some people might get a laugh out of it. Some people might give you the feedback that you're looking for to improve it better. Um, even just by laughing at you. Um, are you laughing with me? Or are you laughing at me? Um, but either way, you, you start to get seen. And that's the whole part of like the Pepsi and the Budweiser, these giant campaigns um, the awareness part of the funnel is the biggest part. So as, the more awareness you have, you know, whether or not you're into Coke or you're into Pepsi, Pepsi earned some customers there. And then those moms stocked it in their fridge all their lives. And then their kids have it. And now they're, those kids are growing up and they have kids and that's their product. So um, it's really just about like gaining notoriety, awareness, um, making sure people know what you're talking about when you say this brand. Um, and you know, you can do that with a small budget, as long as you know, your target audience, um, you, you know, the reputation that you're trying to create and the story that you're trying to tell, um, and how you want to do that. And so it, that, when it, that's when it comes all, everything kind of comes together. You got the marketing, you got advertising, you got branding, you got PR. It's really kind of all intertwined until you really get drilled down to say, this is the person who's coming up with the creative look, right? The graphics of it. This is the person who's coming up with the creative uh, text and, and verbiage of it. But other than that, it's under a big umbrella of really just, it's really promotions and, and how do you promote it? Some of that's through marketing, some of that's through advertising, it's branding. Uh, you are now in the uh, publishing world and so what was, you know, what was unique to what you're doing now, different than, you know, what you were doing in the past? You were working on restaurants, you were working for individual companies. Um, How is it different now? Um, it's different now because 
everything with books, they really are their own product each time, even if it's a detective novel and, and another detective novel launching, you know, around the same time. Um, the, the contents, the author, they're totally different. Um, so you have to, you have to approach it, uh, in a, in a different way every single time. And you have to be familiar with your product. You have to investigate like who is actually going to be interested in these themes. Um, I would say that that's the most different because I could sell, you know, if we had hamburgers or pizza, like most of us all eat hamburgers and pizza, <laughs> but so that's kind of easy, like to market, but you might read crime novels and I might read romance. Um, I'm not really trying to reach me with a crime novel if I'm a romance person. Um, so it's, it's a bigger, it's more fish to fry perhaps. <laughs> um, it, a lot of fun. But you might still, in, if someone who's a reader might, expand their horizons uh, you know someone like me i'm i don't read a lot so i and i don't even know that i have anything i'm more fiction than not but if i do read it i don't i don't think you can pigeonhole me into any category but someone who's a reader might be like hey i've read a lot of this let me try and uh, expand and do something different so it could be you know yeah, and there's a lot of like overlapping stuff. Um, so we have Silent Came the Monster that launched today, and um, that is a historic fiction novel um, about the New Jersey shark attacks, I think, in 1916. Um, and that's really the story that inspired Jaws. So even if you're not a diehard historical fiction reader, you might be a shark fan. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, you, you kind of extract these elements and meet different audiences with those hooks. Um, so I'll, I'll have my, my fallback, my classic historical fiction. I know everybody's going to enjoy this, but um, I, I'll, I'll give, grab some other people from different, you know, audiences that have interests that, you know, maybe they live in the Jersey Shore. Maybe they are, you know, diehard Shark Week watchers. Um so yeah, you're, you're right. There are, there's a lot of overlap, but you kind of like dissect it first, build out your personas and then um, start to drill down on like how you can hook in the other um, lesser, lesser known audiences. Is, That's obvious. Is, it, is it important to market Blackstone? I mean, do pe are people going to care who published it as much in the same way that I almost don't care what movie outfit put this out i want to look at the director right or the or the producer or who it came or um talk about the difference of, of that and what and how you're marketing and and branding well if they don't i think they should um what is interesting about blackstone is we are one of the largest independent publishers in the united states um, what that means is we're, we're not a part of the big five, which is like Penguin, um, Hachette, you know, those that you see on in every bookstore period. Um, so we are kind of, we're playing a different game, um, but we've really leaned into that. So we've, we've developed a lot of proprietary, not me, our insane IT team. Really? <laughs> developed a lot of proprietary um, software that really sets us apart. Um, we've really, since the big five are very traditional, we've gone kind of uh, disruptive in that way where we focus on a lot of video assets and um, trailers, that type of thing. We have um, a fabulous PR team that will, you know, really get their hands dirty and dig into any lead possible. Um, and then, you know, we'll show up to <laughs> the author events and stuff because we, we've got boots on the ground, you know, across the United States. And um, it's, you know, it, it's just less corporate-y because it's not as big. Um, so you kind of get these like very significant um, touches it's along the publishing process and everybody is very, very involved. Um, but we're obviously growing too. So, 
But that's from your, I mean, from your perspective, and I love it. I, you, you say disruptor, you say boots on the ground. That's all stuff that I try and incorporate in, in what I do. But as a reader, if I like an author, I'm going to want to read their book. If I like a certain topic, I'm going to want to do it. I almost don't, and maybe I'm wrong. I almost don't care who publishes it. So from a B2C perspective, it's not as important, but to get your name out there, to get the authors to want to work with you, that's probably more important in yeah. the, you know, the company. Yeah, it's almost like a different side of marketing. I, I would say that, you know, how we handle a project and a campaign, um, that's our way of marketing to other authors to maybe give us a shot. Maybe they've been with the big five and um, they want to go somewhere independent. Um, what's, what I would think if you were just like a buyer, um, yeah, it doesn't so much matter who publishes it. I mean, I would love for everyone to make sure they buy at least one Blackstone book a month, but it's at the website like, website my ads before there. you do it. Um, publishing.com. And I think there's a 20% off your first time purchase. So yeah, sign up for our newsletter. Um, my friend Nathan will be sending you the funnest newsletters of all time a couple times a month and you can opt into whatever genre you like. But um, yeah, so I, I think if just the average consumer, maybe they are a little, um, you know, it, it's the difference between like buying from a Barnes and Noble or buying from an independent bookstore. Um, it, it's totally okay to do both. The bottom line is everybody should try and read as much as they can because it only, it, it doesn't matter if it's fiction. Um, it just, it makes you better. It's fun. Um, it's exciting and you, you, you'll learn something from every book you pick up, even if you hated it. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, I would like to read more and I started a, a little bit Well, I'll do my, we'll do my book recommendations. Now this is called turquoise dream by Brett Wiskins. And he's a singer songwriter. We had him on the show and this is number five in a series of books about a, uh, sort of private detective and it's great. Um, I love the cover. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, that reminds me of the Dosa Keys guy. It does look like the, uh, <laughs> the most interesting man yeah. in the world. And it's interesting. Um, the character is called Bear Whitman. And I think he's looking to maybe put it into some type of film, which I thought he should. I think it would make a great, a great series. But let's talk about the cover. I am a very visual person. I will gravitate towards a more interesting cover. Um, and even if it's on the side like this, when you're looking at a lot, let's say if I'm at a library, which we don't do as much anymore, but if you're looking at a, a screen full of covers, I'm definitely going to buy or, or it's going to pique my interest, not knowing anything about anything. Yeah. People do judge books by their cover. Yeah. <laughs> I know the old adage, but it's, it's wrong. People, you should judge a book by its cover. Um, there are fantastic teams behind developing those. Um, the authors always come with their ideas and it's a, it's a beautiful process and, you know, a, a painstaking on the creative side and a lot of heart goes into it. So um, I love when I see a nice cover and I love when people say I was drawn to the cover. And you guys, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Blackstone Publishing was or is with primarily audio books. So they started um, primarily with audio. Um, I think our founders, Craig and Michelle Black, like started in a basement and um, really built up the um, audiobook side. But we have recently got into printing. Um, I don't want to pretend like I'm a Blackstone historian because I'm still <laughs> relatively new going on like my second year. Um, but it's uh, fabulous founders and, um, you know, definitely start, started in the audio sector, which is such a growing market right now. Um, again, you can get so much out of reading or listening to an audiobook as well. If you don't have the time, um, get audible, get downpour.com. You can even just like rent audiobooks, which is great. Um, but Yes. So now we've moved into print as well, which has been a huge learning moment, I'm sure, for everyone on the operations team and that type of thing. But uh, we are excited to have all formats available. So I guess if people don't know, um, sometimes publishers can own just the rights to like an ebook or just the audiobook. So like digital rights 
or you can have all rights, which include the rights to like the hardcover, the paperback, the large print. Um, so it, it's a full scale production for every product because all of those products become their own products, um, which you also have to advertise those. Right. So. <laughs> you got to market uh, audio and eBooks. Yeah. 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 You know, looking and, at something like this, you should create something like this. Yeah. So we, we, uh, it just reminded me, did you see the movie Tetris? Mm -mm. A, sort of a, I don't know if it's documents, a movie about the history of Tetris and how it got to the U.S. and how it got big from Russia. But that was an interesting story about the different kinds of rights that can be held. And, you know, it's a cutthroat business and it could mean the difference, you know, between a lot of money. And um, but it's I would recommend Tetris. That's a, a show. I, I can't remember which streaming it's on, but it's I definitely recommend that. And then we talk about the difference between audio and uh, eBooks and then, you know, just holding it. My wife and I over the weekend were listening to Dateline. We like to watch Dateline, but we, we listened to the Dateline podcast. And it, for me, it was an easy listen, but I don't, I don't know that I would listen to a book. I know a lot of people do in the car and that's a really great way to do it. Um, what, what type of reader have, were you in the past? Do you like a, a Kindle? I, I have to hold the book and read it. Otherwise, you know, for me, it's it, it's not, I'm probably not going to do it. I'm primarily reading um, EPUB files, which is essentially the Kindle version right now, um, just because I have access to them. And, and again, our proprietary technology that our insane wizards of IT <laughs> made. Um, so I can read our books before they're released and, um, I'm, I'm doing that a lot and I can do it like really fast. I, I become more of a skimmer. Um, if I'm reading a book, you know, for book club, I usually just order it um, or, you know, pick it up from local bookshop. Uh, audio is fantastic though. I listen to audiobooks. I mean, even if I'm just like going to the gas station really quickly, you know, maybe like a seven minute round trip. Um, I'll, I'll pop on my audible and listen to an audio book, um, even for that short amount of time. And it's, it's so gripping. I find myself like wanting to find more, you know, reasons to get out of the house or to go on a walk and that type of thing. Um, we have an awesome team of, uh, I, I guess they're like our audio book casters and we have, you know, Studios everywhere, or we'll like book studios closer to the people that we actually cast. But like a lot of the audiobooks are like actual performances. So if it's told, you know, from four different point of views, we'll hire four different people to match the character descriptions, voice, that type of thing. Yeah. And they'll really like sit there and like direct it and perform <laughs> these books. So it's, it's kind of like watching a movie if you are, you know, have the imagination. <laughs> Yeah, it, you, there's definitely a value to who is saying it, because especially when I, with the Dateline, it's like very recognizable voice. It's almost like, ha, you know, the joke about having Morgan Freeman, you know, narrate everything. Um, and they do that with little shorts on TV where they get, you know, you get Tom Brady to do it for uh, for ESPN. or um, So I think that you know, there's a lot of value to that, especially, when, you know, the experience of someone who wants to, to listen into something from an author's perspective or even from um, Blackstone perspective, if I'm selling it in an audio book, I'm selling it in an ebook and I'm printing it. Is there one that you push more than the other because it just brings more revenue for you, a, you know, bigger profits. Um, and what do you see the split on? If you put one out in all three, do you have a sense for the split on how it's consumed? Um, I mean, everything serves its purpose in a different way. Um, obviously like an ebook and an audiobook, we're not having to make anything, um, besides, you know, obviously there's like the production of it or whatever, but the, the, the cost of the good is, you know, kind of one and done. Yeah. So I, I would say that the profit margins are higher on that just because of that, you know, one piece. Um, but there's, there's a lot of different nuances for how you can publish an audiobook or a ebook. Um, there's like Kindle unlimited, 
where I think you pay like a subscription fee and um, you can read any books on Kindle Unlimited for free. And then authors, I believe, get paid like off of royalties, but page reads. Um, and then, of course, like Audible has like the membership. So you, you get like your 12 credits a month or a year, what have you. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different than like buying a la carte, which is, you know, more expensive to the consumer. I think it's like $27 sometimes for a book. Um, so, it, I mean, the the gold standard, I would say, that everybody is going for is um, making those lists like the New York, New York Times bestseller list, which holler at Geneva Rose and Blackstone Publishing. We hit that two weeks ago with um, You Shouldn't Have Come Here. It's an Airbnb thriller. It's a ton of fun written by the author of The Perfect Marriage. Her name's Geneva Rose, and she's hilarious on the social channels. Um, but so, you know, for a really big book, you definitely want to push like the hardcover format. Um, but everything complements each other. A lot of people do buy the physical books and also listen to the audiobook, you know, on their way to work or whatever. So they can snap through these reads. I mean, people get competitive with reading. I'm, I'm in these book clubs online and people are like, I've already read, you know, 300 books this year or something. I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, where do you have the time? But yeah, I, I guess if you're doing audio and you're driving or I don't know. Yeah. And, and it also depends on um, who the target audience is. So I'm glad you mentioned the driving thing again. Like um, a lot of, you know, people are into, you know, fantasy books, like those lit RPG kind of like role-playing gamification books. Um, and I'm thinking, and I'm finding a lot of data to support that that is um, some people that do commuting for, for a living, you know, maybe like with their CDL license or that type of thing. Um, if you're, if you're making a long trip frequently, I can see how you would like the fantasy escapism type genre. Um, so it's, it's really fun to learn about the different types of people and, you know, what, what their preferred for, format is. I think that that, um, that fantasy genre does enjoy the Kindle and the, um, audiobook over like hardcover and paperback. You shouldn't have come here by Geneva Rose, New York Times bestseller. Check oh, it thank out. You. Yeah. Blackstone Publishing. Yeah. Um, Airbnb. It's almost like a uh, hostel. Remember when they. Yeah. Out with that movie, and you're just like, whoa, now I'm, I'm not going to stay in a hostel. I think I went to Europe like right after. I didn't end up watching those. Okay. But I went to Europe right after there. Uh, what or what is your personal favorite? I want to I want to share some of mine, uh, some more books that I'm reading. But give me a, a give me a, a a favorite of yours, a book recommendation that you have that is not Blackstone, and then give us another one that is Blackstone that maybe uh, off the radar. Um, so I would say my favorite book of all time. This is not a Blackstone title. It is called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, it. I love you about it. It's a fantastic book. I read it when I was 14 and I got in a little spat with my mom and I still to this day remember with my hand on my hip saying, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to move to Savannah, Georgia one day. Anyway, <laughs> and we don't have to talk. And, you know, fast forward to out of college, moved to Savannah, Georgia. Um, so that book really stuck with me. And it is, it's so cool to kind of like live that out every day. Um, it's a nonfiction kind of murder mystery thing, but it, it's really Savannah is the main character in that book. And Savannah is the main character in my life right now. I mean, what a cool place to live. Um, you the movie, you, I assume you watched the movie. I did. Um, John Cusack is also like my celebrity crush. I did not like the movie so much. No. So is that you, because of the book? Huh? You think that's because of the book? I, yeah, the book was just like so widescaping, epic, and like it, they missed out on so many like elements. Um, I don't think it's anything about the actors or any of that. It just I think that they just kind of they missed a lot of pieces and. The book is just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It, would, it would be hard to live up to. Uh, speaking of Savannah, as anyone who follows the show knows, we're a big supporter of the Savannah Bananas. We do uh, badges for them for their VIB. 
Uh, definitely recommend Fans First, which is a, a book by Jesse Cole. And today they launched Banana Ball, which is a new book uh, by by Jesse, which is which is out now. So both good reads. Jesse is a fantastic uh, marketer and entrepreneur, and um, you know, crazy to see what's going on with them. Um, one of the great things to do if you're ever in Savannah and they're playing, and if you could. Find a hold of, uh, <laughs> of tickets, which I've been lucky to go to. But there's so much history in Savannah. Um, living there, how does it ever get old? I mean, like you visit and you want to see everything, and then maybe all of that stuff doesn't mean as much because it's more touristy. Does that has that happened or hasn't happened yet? Or do you? What are your thoughts on that? Going to a place like that's so historic, like Savannah. Um, I, I mean, to this day, I would hop on any tour I possibly could. I always love like they, they do walking tours all the time. They have the trolley stuff. They have hearse tours, but anytime I I'm, like behind a walking tour, I end up like stalking them for a couple of blocks or whatever, because you hear something new every time. Um, the host of those tours are always like funny and just so knowledgeable, um so that part no but like there's river street which i probably have ventured to like three times since you know i moved here um and, and i mean it's beautiful it's just like far away and it's very touristy but um yeah i mean like there's there's parts that like i think everyone kind of avoids and then there's other parts that i have to continue to remind myself sometimes you know, I will walk or I'll drive and I'm not looking at our beautiful oak trees with the Spanish moss hanging. And then other days I'm like, just in awe by it. I'm like, why, why do I always forget that it's so beautiful here? <laughs> like just stop for a minute and soak it all in because this is so cool. It's really like walking in a fairy tale. The trip I was there the longest was, it was at the end of the year. So it was a little too cold. We didn't get to do maybe as much as I want to do, but still got a chance to walk through, you know, all the parks. And um, I, I love it. I, I think it's, it's interesting. Like when you're in Florida, we talk about that's a really close place to visit. And then ultimately I think because of the history and the food, Savannah gets lumped in with Charleston, right. Mm -hmm. And those are very close. So it's very easy to just take a week and spend it uh, half it, half and uh, half and half in each. Um, but it, it's interesting, like when you live in Savannah and you travel to other places like even Atlanta or, you know, Orlando and South Florida, how, uh, how much of a culture do you, do you, do you get shocked by the difference in where you're living now and the, and the way people are in the rest of the world? It's. I mean, yes and no, there's only jerks here and there's jerks everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> Um, it's a different but, way of living, southern yeah. living, and well, what's interesting about Savannah is we do have this open container law. So if you're in historic downtown, you can enter any bar or restaurant, and they have just literal like sleeves of to-go plastic cups where you can just pour your beer or whatever drink you were having, and you can walk around with your alcoholic beverage. And I tend to believe that that makes people a little bit more welcoming. Yes. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think I think. We're definitely friendly and laid back here. Everyone is, everyone kind of knows everyone in Savannah. Like there's really no secrets you can hide. Um, you know, doctors, lawyers, uh, wait staff, like everyone gets along. There's really not much judgmental stuff going on here, which I really love. Um, I like that everyone can just kind of like bump elbows, cross paths, and, you know, find things to talk about. The, um, where else would you consider living if you had to, you know, live where you, where you work and you couldn't just live anywhere? <sighs> so tough. I mean, maybe out of the country. I don't know. Maybe just like travel constantly. I don't think there's another place in the United States that I would love more than Savannah, to be honest. But, uh, and there's a lot of fabulous places. That's just how right. hard I, you know, have a passion for the city. Um, yeah. I, but I, you grow up saying you're going to be there and then 
you get there. It could have been maybe you didn't care for. Who knows? There's no. I think pe- most people, depending on who they are, could kind of live anywhere if there's, you know, depending on what their real needs are. Like what what are they passionate about when you're not working? You know, and there's a, Savannah pretty much has everything you need. Although it is, you know, it's flat. Still, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do miss like mountains and stuff like that. I love a good mountain view and I like hiking. Um, I think it's, it's definitely hot here, but um, you know. can go on day trips or not, or weekend trips to mountains in, uh, in Georgia. Not that, not that. Yeah, small. yeah exactly. The, um, the, the books that uh, Blackstone is, uh, is putting out there. Uh, how, how often are they bringing on new authors and how often is it let's we have some pretty good authors and let's keep pushing their stuff um yeah i mean we we are only getting bigger and better so uh we've we've brought on a ton i i don't even have like a number floating in my head that i could throw out and feel confident because again, there, there's just so many different elements. Like sometimes we'll just pick up audio rights to some stuff and that type of thing. But, um, we're, we're definitely growing. Um, we have a nice acquisitions team. Um, and they're constantly looking at different opportunities. Um, we've gotten kind of into the comic books world, uh, recently with, um, Brendan Beenan who is one of our, um, he, he's on our editorial staff. And then he also works on our like TV and movie rights deals. Um, he is a ton of fun and he's so brilliant, but um, he's, he's brought on some really cool projects. Um, the girls from Hush Cabin is one of his that are coming out. That's coming out in August and it's going to be like a YA thriller. That's the most recent book from us that I read. And it is a romp. I can't wait. It's like Pretty Little Liars. If you ever binge watched that, you probably didn't. But it's so good. Um, juicy. It's like Vanderpump Rules right now. Another thing I'm binging. Vanderpump? Yeah. It's got me in a chokehold. We, we might have talked about this, but have you ever thought about writing a book? And if, if so, what do you think it would be? Um. I've thought about it a ton. I have like several different projects kind of floating around in my head and I just need to like glue my butt down and try it. Um, I, I definitely have written some children's books, which are, I think a lot of fun, but um, I had considered writing a book about the Berlin wall coming down and some, uh, a group of like hitchhikers or, you know, uh, wanderers, backpackers, that type of thing, all kind of met there. Cause you know, when they took it down, it was like a giant party. Um, so they all met there and then they wake up and somebody is dead oh. and everybody like goes their own ways after that. Yeah. And then Facebook comes up and because I think the Berlin wall came down in the eighties. But uh, Facebook comes up and somebody gets a message like, I know what happened. And then they all start getting messages and kind of just like a mystery from there. I know. I don't know. know. <laughs> so that's, that's the only idea I have. <laughs> I oh, that's, <laughs> look, I think what would what, you know, the challenge of a, someone who could be a great writer, but never written or you don't know who it is, is you got to take a chance on that book to read to see how good it is. Now I, my, my friend always tells me you love every movie you see. And I probably like every book I read because I know what I'm going to like. Um, so for me, it's easy to pick and say, no, I don't know that I would really like that. Although I would imagine in books, I probably would enjoy more than I think I would. It's just a matter of taking the time to sit down and read. I love movies more than shows, more than books because it's all plays out in one I just concentrate on that and it's a clean start yeah. <laughs> finish as opposed to so if I can't read a book in a couple sittings, I'm probably not going to want to read it. Yeah. Um, well, that's, I never read a book. I mean, sometimes I'll read a book in like a sitting, but uh, I don't know. Sometimes you just need yeah. like a mental like step away, especially when you're actually reading the like reading 
the words instead of listening or whatever. Um, it does kind of feel like, not like work, but it's, it's a lot of like processing, at least from my head, it's doing a lot of things at once. Yeah, I need to pay attention, like, even when I'm listening to podcasts. So that's like, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm the norm here because you could listen to six, seven minutes of a book, you know, once a day, and and that would be good for you. That's a good way for you to consume. And I assume there's a lot of other people who probably are okay consuming it that way. For me, it's like I constantly, I, I gotta, I don't want to have to rewind. Like I'll rewind something on a show if I miss it. And I'm like, oh, what? I missed it. And if I have to start doing that three, four times during a sitting, I'm going to get annoyed by it. So I kind of like to just consume everything. Um, but I do, I did find myself trying to picture what was going on, which is the, I think the sign of a good book or being able to picture. So that's whether you're reading or audioing it, I think making it into a movie, but I don't know that I'd want to necessarily see a movie that I've already read or read the book of a movie I've already seen. So I think it's kind of like almost one or the other. That's how, that's how I feel. Yeah. A marketing hook I use a lot is read it before you stream it. And I think that, you know, there's definitely people who have similar sentiments as you, but there is a big population out there that prefers to read the book first. Um, you know, people either loved or hated that where the crowd ad seeing, which is, um, a Reese Witherspoon book club book, and she produced the movie. I thought the movie was excellent, but I never read the book. What before. movie was that? It's called Where the Crowd At Sing. Oh, I didn't see it yet, but I definitely, it's on my list. Oh, I thought it was an awesome movie. And I, I, I'm in all these book clubs, and I saw all these people that were like disappointed because I guess the book is probably fantastic too, and maybe didn't miss pieces, but the movie to me was excellent. Like night and day from if we're talking about Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. <laughs> yeah, but when you when you re, like, I always I just watched a man called Otto. Love the movie. I hear it's a good book, but I assume if I read the book now that I have this mental image, and I'm it, it's not almost going to matter in in reading the book. Whereas if I read a book. You could sort of have this mental image, and now you're watching a movie that's probably different than the image you had, and that might, uh, you know, harm your enjoyment of it. Yeah, I mean, Harry Potter, I definitely had different images for all those people, and I also called Hermione Hermoyne <laughs> reading it at like 12 years old. <laughs> that kind of ruined her name for me, but it's, uh, I, I mean, I still love the movies and the books equally. Well, the books I probably love better, but um, I don't know. Sometimes when you finish a movie or like uh, a book, it really leaves you wanting more. And I know that that's like, sounds like a cliche, but it's definitely happened to me where I immediately dive into something else that the author's written or like I try and find um, as many things similar as possible. Or like if there's like fan fiction, sometimes I'll read that online um, I don't know. Just to me, sometimes you just want left wanting more. And that's when I would dive into the movie immediately or the book. John yeah. Oliver. I listen to comedy a lot. And John Oliver who was uh, last week tonight on HBO. He did a bit where he was talking about, there are fans out there who write fan fiction, but it's kind of like X rated fan fiction. Uh, where they have him, And it sounds like it's awesome. I'm like, I want to read that stuff. <laughs> but you see, you know, a lot, I'm a family guy and, and Seinfeld person. And, you know, you've seen weird kind of photos, but I would, I think that would be great to read. I should get in, but it, I could see you going down a real rabbit hole. With this. <laughs> yeah. I um, love NASCAR, like really love NASCAR. So, and I also love Harry Potter. Um, my friend found some fan fiction, but it was like, if Harry, if Hogwarts was NASCAR school. Okay. And it was so funny. Like, I, I would read all seven books of Harry Potter and NASCAR school. Yeah, I think I think so too. There's a, I mean, the it, to me, the internet is always undefeated. There's the creativity that's there, and the the genius and and um, imagination, which you know, in in books, it's unlimited. Mm -hmm. There's literally nothing. I mean, now there's probably nothing you can't that. There's probably nothing that can't be created or recreated or imagined on the screen, but 
in reality, that's true for books. I mean, any literally anything can be written and you're going to have some thought about what that is. So I think from that respect, reading is really, you know, allows yourself to get lost in, uh, in imagination. That's more from a fiction point of view, but a nonfiction sort of almost makes you feel like you're like you're right there. Yeah. Well, a lot of the nonfiction books I read are like uh, entrepreneurial. I hate saying that word, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, he has a great one. And if you want to try audiobooks, I would try that because I think this is up your alley. Um, you really could just like listen in spurts and get some like great pointers and I don't know stuff like that. It's it's almost like the same as effect as like workout music for people, you know, like they get hyped. This is my dog got there. Sorry. Um, uh, so like I, I get hype off of like atomic habits and, uh, you know, freedom and responsibility. Um, we have a great, um, uh, nonfiction kind of self-help title title coming out from Greg Harden, who was uh, a coach at the university of Miss Michigan. And he's like Tom Brady's personal mentor. So it's called Stay Sane in an Insane World. I'm hyped for that one. Um, but I, th those are kind of the nonfictions that I lean towards, even though my favorite book is technically a nonfiction and it's totally just like a yeah. account of a murder in Savannah. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at you guys have Michael Crichton coming out. That's a, a, a very well-known author. So, you know, not like you don't have books from people who will be known. Mm -hmm. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, we've got um, a cool project coming out with Robert Downey Jr. Um, there's all kinds of, I mean, we we really have uh, been working hard, our team, to, to secure these, like, incredible deals. Um, and, you know, we've been, we've been lucky to work with just really phenomenal people like uh, Norman Reedus from The Walking Dead. He, uh, we released a book with him last year and that was the first time that we hit the New York times bestseller list. It's called the ravaged, um, that actually launched last week in paperback. So people can get it a little bit cheaper now. Um, but yeah, so anyone from celebrities to musicians, we had, um, Gordon Ramsay who just passed earlier this year. Um, we released his book last week, um, gentlemen of jazz. So there's really no <laughs> rock unturned. Um, we just love telling as many stories as we possibly can that are worth sharing. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, one of those things that's never gone away. People love to read. They're always going to want to read. I, I believe people are always going to want to read uh, with a book in their hand. Um, but I, I see the popularity of the Kindles of the world and audio, you know, audio books too, but it's just, and there's, there's so many good authors there's so many good stories that people have whether it's their own story um or creating a fiction and a fantasy world for for other other people to live in um and you see that almost in the in the in the movies too the amount of documentaries or or just life stories like george foreman and um all you know it's yeah. crazy. elton john and you know but people will want to read about about these people too oh yeah yeah, definitely like celebrities have a leg up from their already like super fandom. But you're right. There are just so many fantastic authors out there. And that's always what like blows my mind because here I am thinking I have all these ideas spinning around in my head and I just, I, it's hard to sit down and do. So like kudos to them because it really like, it, it must take a lot out of you. Sometimes it takes a lot out of you to read some of these stories, um, you know, especially the ones that are like deep, emotional and that type of thing. So also we're always our own worst critic. You know, it, that's a tough thing to, to be like, or we're blinded by, you know, biased of it. I, I watched the, the movie documentary still it's uh, the Michael J Fox story. And uh, I thought it was awesome. I'm a big Michael J. Fox fan. Back to the Future is one of my favorite movies. But uh, in it, he is actually does a little bit of recording for what appears to be an audio book where he's sort of telling the story. And it's cool to come into his voice. But, I mean, there's so many people with, uh, with such a great story uh, to tell that I think everyone should write a book or do some sort of document 
uh, documentary on their own life. A part of it was he was saying, you know, do this now because in, who knows if I'm going to be able to do this in five or 10 years. Yeah. Um. Depend on, but it was a great read. But also the other thing, I, reason I brought that up is um, Brendan Tartikoff, who was like the chief honcho at NBC, originally said he didn't think that anyone would uh, respond favorably to Michael J. Fox being um, Alex P. Keaton on Family Ties. And he didn't want him to do it. And I say that to be like, if I write something and I give it to someone and they don't like it, I, th that doesn't mean it could be a publisher. It doesn't mean that that's not something that's going to work. So that's the other challenge is writing it first then getting in front of people who at least have enough knowledge to, to say this could be a, a good thing and get past the ones who maybe don't see it. And yeah. but they might be right. It might not be good. Who knows? That's probably good. But I mean, I would say for, if you, for first timers, I would really look into the self-publishing thing. Um, there, there are a lot of hurdles and obstacles. And if you get turned down by a publisher, it never means that your book is not worth reading or putting out into the world. It's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult to earn on these things because like you said, there's so many of them going out in the world every Tuesday. <laughs> So um, the competition is aggressive. I would definitely like look into whatever genre uh, story you're trying to tell and understand what consumers are doing in that genre right now. Like what, what, you know, read some different reviews, like see the ones that are top seller on the Amazon list um, and just get familiar and comfortable with it as much as you can and kind of carve out your space. But, Oh, there are bestsellers on even the New York times bestseller list every now and then that are um, self-published authors. And I mean, they're making a killing and they have devoted fans and uh, it's, it's definitely a way to do it and to do it, you know, fast and to learn, like I was talking about earlier, just like experiment fast, fail quick, and then pick up and do the next thing. But I mean, writing a whole book might be different to feel get on like. the computer or, get, or just start writing and you never know yeah. where that can take you um, because nobody writes a book in one sitting without many, many, many edits anyway. So <laughs> yeah. Whatever you write is not going to be uh, printable regardless of how good it is. So that's, you know, the, to me, just sit down and do it. I definitely have some ideas myself. I, I, I think it's more uh, nonfiction, but I don't know. I have a good imagination, but I don't know about, I'm always awed, in awe of the people who can tid tidily wrap up a story, whether it's in a movie or, you know, when you have like 30, you know, episodes of a, a, a sitcom, you can sort of extend it. It doesn't always have to be so tight, but a movie, it's got to be tight. Otherwise there's people out there just going to be picking it apart. So yeah. I mean, I'll buy that. I'll do a little trivia for you. Do you know what the most read book in the world is? The Bible. <laughs> now, it's probably not the most sold. Uh, I also looked up the best-selling books of all time. And the first Tuesday one I would never have guessed. Do you, have you ever looked this up? Tuesdays the Morning. No. No, no. The, the best-selling book, Don Quixote. Oh, really? 500 million copies. So we have kind of a feminist retelling of that called, oh shoot, what is um, Okay, go back, next question. Yeah, the, the Da Vinci Code, which is a, a book I read during a hurricane many years ago in like two days maybe, which was, uh, that's number 11 at 80 million copies. My wow. favorite book of all time, um, The Catcher in the Rye is number 14 at 65 million copies. And then you got a ton of the Harry Potter books um, and you got the Hobbit and uh, Lord of the Rings. A Tale of Two Cities is second with 200 million sold, which is wow. interesting. I'm actually blown away by the Don Quixote thing. Yeah. 500 million is not even close. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah. Um, I was looking up like the highest paid authors recently. I think yeah. James Patterson owns it, but... Um, yeah, interesting, interesting numbers. And people are still uh, buying the Bible or reading the Bible. Yeah. 
I don't know. I'm Jewish, so I don't, you know, it's not for me. But I'm not a reader anyway, so I can't imagine I would read the whole thing. Uh, I, I feel like you'd have to be pretty religious to do that, but I don't know. There are people still doing it. And um, yeah. Well, if you uh, do, you, if you had any books um, that could be put into a movie that you've read, what, what would it be? Any books that be put into yeah. a movie? Well, a book that you've read that you really enjoyed that you would like to see a movie version of it. Um, well, Geneva's book, you shouldn't have come here. I like there already is the whole movie dancing in my head. So I hope that that happens. Um, and I'm sure who I will. Plays, who plays in it? Uh, oh, that's good. Um, man, I'm just like so not up in like that. I would feel like they're younger people. And I don't know any of the celebrities yeah. that are maybe like Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively. Maybe they just both do it. Okay. And again, that is You Shouldn't Have Come Here by Geneva Rose, New York Times bestseller. Find it on blackstonepublishing.com and it immediately prompts you to sign up for the newsletter and offers you 20% off your first purchase. So check it out there. Uh, we're going to let you out of the wolf den with the same question that everybody gets. You can spend a full day, 24 hours with anybody in the world but they have to be alive and you can't be related to them. Who would you choose and what would you guys do? Oh, um, I, Ooh, this is so tough. I don't like the alive part. I feel like yeah. that, like, makes, it, makes it tougher. <laughs> you know what? I, I think that I'm going to go Denny Hamlin. He races the number 11 FedEx yeah. car in NASCAR. <laughs> Um, and we are probably going to go golf with Michael Jordan. And uh, now you're adding extra people. And let, <laughs> oh, you have to handle yeah. know that. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to, we're going to go golfing and, um, I don't know, do some NASCAR shit. Chicago's got a street race coming with NASCAR. What do you think about that? I wanted to go so bad. Um, I'm going to Bristol's night race in September, but, um, couldn't swing the Chicago thing. I'm trying to see if I could finesse F1 tickets in Vegas. Yeah, that'll be. I'm actually going to be in Chicago when the street race is going on. I haven't decided okay. if we're going to go. It's it's pretty ex expensive, but we'll see. Uh, I know we're going to catch a Cubs game. My wife's never been there, so okay. we'll catch a Cubs game. But, um, yeah, NASCAR is uh, – it's crazy how the brand that they've built and it's expanded. It's not just – you know, your father's NASCAR, right? The, the way yeah. that they've been able to market and brand it. And uh, I'll, I'll let you know if I, if I make it out there. Oh, you should. It would be fun for sure. Check out blackstonepublishing.com on Instagram at Blackstone Publishing. A lot of great options for books, audio books, some good stuff coming out. Really appreciate your uh, insight here. And uh, I was impressed by the, the stuff that you did in the short time when you were when you were with Weldon and obviously yeah. uh, in competing companies, but uh, caught my eye. So that's why I connected and want to have a conversation with you and look forward to whatever comes next. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was a nice work. All right. We got another episode uh, tomorrow. So tune in and uh, have a great night. We'll talk to you soon.